My, our next presentation is uh, Thomas Shelley, a chemical safety and hazardous material specialist. He's a chemist by profession. He has uh, some experience in the ground uh, with draining waste fluids and uh, with different chemical mixtures. He will talk to us about the established links between chemicals and health and address some of the issues of radioactivity in the waste fluid. Mr. Shelley, attending Bowling Green University in Ohio, majoring in geology and chemistry, much of Mr. Shelley's early working career was spent as chemist doing analytical work in industrial labs. He also worked for two years as a research technician for the development molecular biologist Cornell University. He is uh, now retired and volunteer with several sustainability related organization in Ithaca and Tompkins County. Do welcome Thomas Shelley. Mr. Shelley. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I have a, a bit of an agenda here. Um, I'm going to discuss a little bit the precautionary principle, which maybe some of you are familiar with already. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the uh, toxicology. Uh, it's important to know how these things can affect us, you know, the, the various industrial processes around us related to hydrofracking and other uh, type of industrial activities. Um, the chemicals used in hydrofracking particular products and individual ingredients. Uh, what comes back out of the ground, we've heard some of that already, we'll have a couple more details for you. Uh, air contamination and spills once again, and uh, a few things you can do to help out here along the way. Okay, the precautionary principle is basically a principle that states that <coughs> uh, we shall do no harm. It's um, generally speaking, uh, anyone who is going to produce or introduce an agent or a product into the consumer environment should be able to know definitively that whatever they are inducing into our environment isn't going to hurt anything or anyone in the environment. Um, <clears throat> in Europe, this is a, a matter of law in many states, and Europeans very strongly support the precautionary principle, specifically in relation to chemical use. Right. It's a pretty advanced here and not very advanced in the United States. A little example of that, just for consumers. All of us are consumers of products. In the United States, there are approximately 10,000 individual chemicals that are used in consumer preparations, such as health and beauty products, uh, hair products, uh, facial products that we use, things like that. In the European Union, 1,500 of those 10,000 products are banned because the health effects of those materials have not been proven. You have to prove that a material is safe before it can be used in a commercial or home product. So they are very advanced relative to us. And of course, the chemical industry in the United States is very, very wary of anybody even mentioning precautionary principle because of the fact that they you know, are very wealthy and want to produce what they want to produce and distribute it the way they see fit to distribute it without being regulated for heaven's sakes. When you get into toxicology, it's a very complex subject. People spend many years getting PhDs in toxicology, and I'm going to give you about a five-second overview. The routes of entry are very important. Inhalation, ingestion, absorption, and injection are the common routes of entry that we know about. Um, the biggie, of course, is inhalation, as Ron mentioned. Air pollution, air contamination are probably the most single point of reference that we're going to run into in terms of any of the hydrofracking or other industrial processes we're talking about. Um, ingestion or swallowing something is unlikely. I mean, we've had some instances of water contamination that have been very publicly you know, brought forth and promoted, like Dimmick, for example, and other areas. Uh, but chances of water contamination and ingesting chemicals from a welling opera well drilling operation, as Ron pointed out, are fairly slim. Absorption through skin or eyes is also pretty slim. Um, injection is a point break in the skin, such as a needle, a needle prick or glass, you know, a cutting you, and then a chemical getting in through that needle prick or a glass or a bacteria or something like that. Um, many of the hazardous materials involved can can have uh, many routes of entry. You can, you know, inhale something, absorb it through your skin, uh, get it in your drinking water. So you know, it depends from chemical to chemical. 
And once again, the dose makes the poison. Our friend Paracelsius uh, had this little phrase that came up with, uh, you know, all things are poison, but the dose makes the poison. That's sort of a paraphrase of what Paracelsius actually said. But um, um, the real quote is, all things are poison and nothing without poison. Only the dose permits something not to be poisonous. And of course, it's the physician's duty to cause no harm that we're familiar with as well as part of that. Um, of course, the word but is right there. But is a big word in the English language. And as Dr. Allah will get into, there are many, many chemicals that are much more hazardous at a very, very low threshold of ingestion instead of the higher threshold of ingestion that would cause immediate concerns. Uh, respiratory uh, uh, system, as I mentioned, most likely affected. Uh, gastrointestinal tract, not so likely infected, but there's still a contamination issue uh, that we're dealing with. Okay. Eyes and skin, uh, anybody who has uh, uh, been in any, any area where there are a lot of chemical factories can easily testify to eye irritation on a bad smog day, for example, from stuff being thrown up into the air, but chances of that happening are pretty low. Um, there are two forms of toxicity we're dealing with here. One is called acute toxicity. This is a short, single exposure. The effects usually appear quickly, and the effects are generally reversible. And chronic toxicity, um, we're talking about repeated exposures, usually to very low doses. Uh, the effects are usually delayed, and the effects are often irreversible. And here we're talking about uh, exposure to very low levels of chemicals over a long period of time that cause some systemic degenerative condition or disease, such as cancer, for example. You know, it takes 15 or 20 years to get most types of cancer, so there's a long-term effect going on here. And that's the big concern, I think, for us here today. The issue of chronic toxicity is the guy working in the drill pad who happens to spill a 55-gallon drum of something all over himself. They're concerned about the short-term exposure and so forth. We're going to have to deal with that so much as the public. There are many different factors that, have, that, that affect our susceptibility to the effects of hazardous materials and agents. Age, nutritional status, uh, physical condition, um, whether you're pregnant or not pregnant, uh, whether you're a heavy cigarette smoker, uh, you know, the duration of exposure, all these different things are factors in determining uh, what might happen to us over time. Okay. Now, in terms of products used uh, in fracking, the DSGIS, the Draft Supplemental Generic Environmental Impact Statement, lists only around 200 products, and 48 have only like a partial disclosure of ingredients for proprietary reasons, uh, chemical secrets the companies like to keep. The Endocrine Disruption Exchange, which Ron mentioned, list uh, in their most recent document from last year around 944 products that are used nationally in, in hydrofracking operations. Not all these are currently in use and probably formulations of many of these things have changed over time because the companies are constantly changing the formulations of their products to stay competitive and to deal with specific geologic formations. Um, I saw an interview with a Chamblisé uh, engineer that said that each well is individually treated by the type of rock, the depth of the rock, the thickness of the rock, how much hydrocarbons are there, how much other materials are there. So the formulations of all these different uh, products that are used in the drilling operations are often done on the fly, right on the site, on the, on the site. Um, <clears throat> only a few products are used at any one time, as I mentioned before, okay? Um, this is a, a schematic. It's actually taken from the uh, 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 draft environmental impact statement. Um, it's also from another reference, which I have here. Uh, most of what they're using, of course, is water and sand. There's 0.5% to 0.75% of other chemicals in use, which are the various additives that we're discussing here. They all have uh, many different functions, and they're all used in teeny amounts. Um, of course, the products used in, in the fracking are, are often very mysterious to the average person looking at them. You know, you would have no idea what's in the product based on the name, and some of this is intentionally done to deceive the average person to not knowing what's in the bag, right? Uh, be it a guy working on the site or not, what's going on? Now, of the actual products used in fracking, less than 1%, as I said, is actually what they call the chemistry of the fracking. Um, the problem, of course, being the being in the slick water high volume 
hydrofracking regime, the quantities of water we're using are staggering quantities. So we're using uh, 500,000 to a million gallons per frac, basically. So we're using between 5,000 and 750,000 gallons of chemicals per fracking operation, which is a lot of chemicals. We're filling up swimming pools with this stuff before it even gets diluted down into the millions of gallons going into the ground. And of course, there are a wide variety of products, as I mentioned before, and um, one or more chemicals in each additive product. Now, the chemicals themselves in New York State, they list about 250 distinct chemicals that have the potential to be used in New York State. I find that to be probably low. Um, TEDx lists nationally about 630 plus uh, distinct substances used in the fracking operations. And the, the Pennsylvania lists 80 chemicals on the Halliburton website. That's all they list is 80 chemicals, which I find to be quite low also. And once again, from our, our, our nice draft environmental impact statement we have here, um, compound specific toxicity data are very limited for many chemical additives to fracking solutions. So basically we have no idea what a lot of this stuff is and what the effects of it are on us. It's not been studied. I'm going to go through a few um, examples of the fracking fluids that are in use. And, um, and of course, one that's ubiquitous in, in many different types of additives uh, is benzene and the other aromatic, low molecular weight aromatic hydrocarbons called BTEX. It's benzene, tylene, ethylbenzene, and xylene that are all basically this, this um, ring system here of carbon atoms with various other hydrogen and other radicals attached off that ring. Um, they're in everything that's basically a uh, 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 hydrocarbon solvent that are in common use in, in various fuels. Um, gasoline, petroleum distillates, diesel fuel, and of course one of the things that comes along with all these things, especially when they're burned, are what are called polyaromatic hydrocarbons, or PHAs. And they're a big component of diesel exhaust and other other burning of anything. If you're burning your steak on the grill at home, you are making polyaromatic hydrocarbons automatically as associated with your burning steak. Um, <clears throat> they're all naturally occurring and produced water. Uh, diesel has been used in the past in fracking operations and it was agreed by the big 10 companies, big 10 gas companies, not to use diesel any longer. This agreement was made several years ago and the EPA not too long ago, late last year, announced that many companies were still using diesel as a mix as in, in fracking operations. And they cited at least one example in Pennsylvania where diesel had been used in, directly in, as part of a fracking fluid. It's supposed to be a big no-no because you're inducing all sorts of carcinogens and stuff, but it's a very useful additive for the companies. All these things are known carcinogens. They're, uh, cause different sorts of cancers, mostly organ-specific things, damage to liver, central nervous system, etc. So they're not good actors. Um, formaldehyde is used in a variety of fracking products, mostly as a preservative. Uh, formaldehyde is a gas, but it's used as, a, as an aqueous liquid in most applications. Um, even in very low concentrations, it's very toxic. It's uh, dangerous in these low concentrations. It has its own OSHA standard, um, so there are, there are, it's very heavily regulated by, the, by OSHA in terms of occupational exposure. It has a 0 0.05 part per million action level, which is a little teeny, teeny amount of formaldehyde. It's a known carcinogen, severe irritant, uh, systemic poison, etc. Ingestion of one ounce of standard 37% solution is known to have caused death, so it doesn't take much to do you in, really. 1,4-dioxane is a, a solvent that's used in surfactants and other products that causes damage to the central nervous system, liver, kidneys, and so forth, probable carcinogen. Hydrochloric acid is used in very large quantities in fracking fluids, and it's often used because the rocks in the Marcellus in particular have a lot of carbonate in them. They tend to be carbonaceous, and carbonate is easily attacked by hydrochloric acid, so at one stage in the early fracking, early in the fracking process, often hydrochloric acid in larger quantities, like tank car quantities, is put down into the well. What this does is it dissolves uh, uh, all sorts of carbonate scum and corrosion. It keeps the pipes clean. It actually helps to break up the, the fracking even more by dissolving carbonate rock 
inside the little fractures that are made during the fracking process. So it's different points during the process that can be used. And sandstone, where you have tight sandstones and people are getting gas out of sandstone using hydrofracking. They use hydrofluoric acid, which dissolves sand. And is even more hazardous materials than hydrofluoric acid. Um, hydrochloric, rather. The chances of your exposure to this material is probably very low. I mean, it's severe corrosive and all kinds of things. It's more of an immediate problem to either emer emergency responders who are cleaning up a spill or to um, the individuals working on the drill pad itself. But it's still a big problem. In Pennsylvania, they've had three now major spills of tank truck operators uh, driving off the road and causing their truck to break up and spill thousands of gallons of this stuff all at once. So it's uh, not a trivial material to be dealing with. Glutaraldehyde is a biocide. It's uh, very toxic. It's one of the very, very few chemicals that has what is called a no adverse effect level, meaning that even a few molecules of this in a living cell are going to cause some disruption of the function of that cell. Its, its effects are observed in 0 0.02 parts per billion, so it's a teeny, teeny amount that can cause problems at the cellular level. It's a very strong mutagen, has severe irritant, and so forth. Uh, methanol is another chemical that's used in big quantities. Um, it's used in many different products. It uses a straight chemical. It's very highly toxic. Uh, one to two milligrams per, to, per kilogram is lethal. It's the chemical that's used to denature alcohol, ordinary alcohol. It's often called wood alcohol, and it's added to make that type of denatured alcohol, non-potable alcohol. Okay. Two of butoxyethanols, one that uh, Ron mentioned before, is used in a very wide variety of products. It's readily absorbed by the skin. It's a very volatile material. Uh, it's an irritant, central nervous system effects, etc. Known endocrine disruptor. I'm sure Adam will mention it again. And it has very low noticeable effects. The big deal, I think, is uh, the bromine-based biocides. The same interview that I heard with the Schlumberger uh, person said that uh, they were adamantly working on what they call green fracking fluids. They were, first of all, you, you take out all the hydrocarbons, you take out all the other bad things, but the man said the real problem was the biocides. They had to have the biocides and they weren't finding any, quote, green biocides because the biocides kill everything that's green. <laughs> Uh, and several of them are, are very poisonous. They're severely toxic. Uh, they cause all sorts of really bad problems to uh, critters living in the environment. For example, they're toxic to fish. One particular chemical, this one here, which is BNDP, is toxic to fish below the level of analytical detection. So this stuff can be in the water and basically not detected detectable with the level of analytical chemistry you have today, sophisticated instruments, and be killing fish. It's also a suspect carcinogen, and it breaks down to form both formaldehyde and nitrosamines in animals, most of which are known human carcinogens. So all these things are, are they're very, in fact, the 80 chemicals that Halliburton said is using in Pennsylvania, one of them was one of these biocides. That's the biocide of choice. And we go on and on here, many different other chemicals. I'm not going to go into any great detail. The long list is there. Um, all the information that I've gotten is on, from public websites that I've used for years and years. The Hazardous Substance Database, run, uh, which is run by the National Library of Medicine, contains information on all these substances. And it's very easy for anyone who has a computer to do an internet search in any one of these things and look up the toxicological information. It's all there in black and white, or electrons, as the case might be. Um, now, the big, the big, one of the big issues is what comes back out of the ground. Each well is going to make between 9 and 35 percent of the fracking fluid uh, have come back out of the well that's put down in the well to start with. So we're talking hundreds of thousands to millions of gallons per well of these fluids coming out of the ground. And there has been, as Ron mentioned, there is some uh, big push in New York State to have closed system treatment, you know, where they would capture these materials, put them in the tanks, and have some industrial waste site treatment right there on site. Um, that might be a good demonstration project for one of the big companies, but there are millions of mom and pop companies that are never going to wind up doing anything like that. They just don't have the funds for it. 
Tony and Graffia's figure is that in, in Pennsylvania there are 78 companies that are actually drilling and fracking in Pennsylvania right now. You have the big eight to 10 companies that are, you know, try to be sort of environmentally responsible, at least on their website. There's the other 70 companies that don't have a penny to rub together and they're just here trying to get into a cash cow situation and they're just doing whatever they can. It's like the Wild West. And Pennsylvania's ability to regulate this industry is, is very low, just like our industry is here with their budgets being cut for their staff and everything else. So things aren't looking up in that regard anyway. Um, the, other, the other components, of course, are a lot of suspended solids, uh, meaning things that are particle size that are suspended in the solution, mineral scales, all sorts of other things. Ron mentioned the acid gases, carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide that are quite corrosive and so forth coming out of the ground. And there are some specific substances, of course, once again, the, um, the BTEX group of chemicals, the benzene, toluene, et cetera, uh, which we mentioned before. Uh, trihalomethanes, trihalomethanes are, for example, chloroform. They're not in the um, stuff going into the well, but they're coming back out of the well. And as Ron mentioned, you're at great depth here. You have 150 degrees or so, you have hundreds or thousands and maybe tens of thousands even of naturally occurring substances and you're injecting other substances in, and you're making what a chemist would see as a perfect chemical reaction vessel where thousands and thousands of individual chemical reactions are taking place and things are being made that weren't in the ground before, that weren't put into the well, that are coming back out of the well. Uh, so the trihalomethanes, which all of which are carcinogens, are one of those things. Um, heavy metals, of course, Ron touched on that, lots of them. This one here, which is very strange material, uh, four nitriloquinoline one oxide, is found in the flowback water, but not in anything going into the well. It's, um, in fact, it's, it's as if, there's a whole paragraph or two about it in the draft environmental impact statement, because it's been noted by various people studying flowback water as being there. It's in very high concentrations, which is very unusual. Um, it's a reproductive and developmental toxin. It's a known carcinogen. It's actually used to induce cancer in animals uh, in research laboratories. So, you know, and it causes biological damage in parts per billion, so it's a very serious concern. And of course we have uh, naturally occurring radioactive materials, or NORM, usually the result of the radium and its uh, de decomposition products, radon daughters as they called. Uh, the level of radioactivity, once again, is many times higher than allowable for discharge to the environment. This is from the, the um, DEC's own study of 13 wells that showed that the radioactive content was fairly substantial. Um, and quote, once again, a nice quote I like from the draft SGEIS, may need regulatory oversight to ensure adequate protection of workers, the general public, and the environment. But maybe it doesn't. We don't know. They're just the DEC. Uh, <clears throat> we don't need to protect it from radioactivity. It's not, not much anyway, as Ron pointed out. Just a little bit. Won't hurt anybody, probably. Um, but we don't know that, for sure. Uh, there are discharge limitations, and if they follow the state discharge limitations, then there are they would be regulated. I don't know if they have to or not, really. Uh, the DEC would like them to follow the norm, you know, to be tested for normal concentrations and so forth prior to discharge. I don't think this is actually happening. Is it, Ron? I've never heard of it happening. He's shaking his head no. Um, the question of impact of all these contaminants from flowbacks uh, on drinking water has, you know, yet to be seen. We've had a few big spills that have affected the immediate people in the area and some contamination that's affected people in the area that's suspect from flowback water, but there have been no long-term studies on any of these things. In fact, if you look in the literature, uh, literature of toxicology and um, epidemi epidemiology, the study of diseases and all these kind of things, there's been almost no studies done on any of this. The last major set of studies was done on what is called the cancer clusters, there are 200 counties in the United States that are cancer counties. They have very elevated rates of many different types of cancers and sometimes sort of unusual types of cancers. And in those counties, there are oil and gas refining capability and chemical production capability that's often massive. And so that's where they're getting their cancer from, is from the effluent, be it through the air, water, or whatever, 
from, from these particular types of industrial facilities. So we'll move on from here. Air contamination is a really big deal, I think. It's going to be the worst problem for many people. You have not only the diesel trucks drawing in and out, but you have thousands of stationary engines. And the stationary engines are running compressors, they're running pumps, they're running all different sorts of equipment on the well pad, and um, they're not regulated at all. <laughs> Some of them are incredibly dirty and nobody cares. Dust is an ubiquitous problem, especially in the summer. Uh, and it's going to stir up all sorts of things that give people hay fever and allergies and things like that. Um, natural gas, of course, is itself venting. And it's a severe greenhouse gas, as many people have read about recently. And it also carries small quantities of all the other things that are volatile that are volatilized in the gas and carried up into the air. Um, and carbon monoxide, of course, is a biggie, but it's only a local contaminant. It's not a serious public health issue, but it's there all the time as well, of course. Hydrogen sulfide that Ron mentioned is not that much of a big deal. Nitrogen oxides are a much bigger deal. Um, the combustion of fossil fuel, in particular diesel engines, flaring and similar operations, creates a lot of, of nitrous oxides, nitrogen oxides, NOx. These react with the volatile organic compounds that come off both the burning of fuels and from the wells themselves and they react to form ground level ozone. And many of us have seen you know, photographs of Los Angeles on a bad day. Well, in the West, in Colorado and Wyoming, there are many areas where hydrofracking has proceeded at a very enhanced rate because it's the Wild West and there's not a person within 100 miles. And some of those areas that used to be pristine wilderness, they are now ozone non-attainment areas. I mean, they can't meet the federal regulation for ozone contamination on the average hot summer day. And we're looking forward to that too. Now this is a very serious problem. In areas of the West where there have been extensive um, hydrofracking, uh, the childhood, one of four children have childhood asthma. Once you get asthma as a child, you're going to have compromised health conditions probably for the rest of your life. So it's a very serious public health issue. And um, anyone who has ever had asthma and been exposed to a high ozone environment like a smoggy day in a big city knows that it's not much fun. The other problem, of course, with ozone is it is a severe uh, problem for agriculture because many, many plants are severely sensitive to ozone. I just want to read you a few. Um, this is from the University of Alabama site that apparently there's a couple profs there that have studied ozone effects on plants extensively. Uh, plants that are considered very sensitive, um, elder, alfalfa, apricot, avocado, um, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, uh, chrysanthemum, dill, duckweed, uh, maples, all kinds, marigold, mint, oak, onion, peach, peas, pumpkin, spinach, squash, sycamore, wheat, and willow. Anybody have any of those plants in their yard or nearby? Yeah, if you have a, a heavy ozone concentration that lasts for very long because of industrialization, those things are going to suffer. Alfalfa in particular is a big concern because it's heavily raised by organic dairy farmers in central and upstate New York. So we have a little bit of issues there with the ozone in the air. Hopefully that won't happen. The, the government's actually trying to reduce the eight-hour primary standard for public exposure to ozone to 0.06 to 0.07 parts per million. They haven't been successful yet. They're still trying to reduce the standard. It's been you know, fought tooth and nail by the auto industry in particular. Uh, particulate matter is a big concern, of course. Everything coming off the of diesel, all those black smokes coming off the back of the bus when the bus fires up. Those are all particulate matter. Most of them are little carbon particles of different kinds, and they carry with them in particular our friend polyaromatic hydrocarbons. Um, some diesel engines produce these type of hydrocarbons in gram quantities per mile, ounces per mile in effect. So we're talking about lots and lots of carcinogens going into the air from diesel engines. Uh, sulfur dioxide, that's a bad thing too. It does bad things to us. Uh, spills are the un unintended release of a material. Um, they can be any form, solid, liquid, gas. They're uh, usually thought of as occurring like accidentally to soil or water or whatever. Um, one of the old adages of the, of the uh, 
of the safety trade is spills happen. There's, there's no way you can prevent spills. I mean, people are human. They make mistakes. They leave the valve open the wrong way. They dump, bump something over when they're tired or whoever, and they cause a spill. Most of these aren't going to affect us very much. Um, they're going to affect people at the drilling site or in the area more around the drilling sites. Um, but lakes and streams could be affected. And Ron gave the example of Tonawanda Creek that was contaminated with fullback fluid. So here again, we want to think overturned trucks. This is, it's very difficult to see this picture, but there's a little red thing right here and a little red thing right there. And here where you can't see it is the cab of a tractor trailer. That truck was carrying thousands of gallons of hydrofluoric acid at the time when it ran off the road and broke in two in Pennsylvania. Uh, the emergency responders came. This is another big issue. Emergency responders showed up. They read the, the information on the truck wrong. They thought they were dealing with hydrochloric acid, not hydrofluoric acid. And they proceeded as if they were cleaning up a hydrochloric acid spill, which is treated very differently than a hydrofluoric acid spill. Several of the people were contaminated with hydrofluoric acid, which is a very serious problem because less than 2% of your, a spill of hydrofluoric acid to less than 2% of your body area will cause death. You won't be able to be rescued. And several of them were seriously contaminated with uh, spilled hydrofluoric acid and at that point, uh, you know, needed medical treatment and all kinds of stuff like that. Okay. Now, many, the other problem, of course, as I mentioned, is that many of the local people, um, hazmat teams, aren't really fully prepared I mean, the industry should be out working with these guys, and in some cases they have been, I think, working with local hazmat response teams to bring them up to speed to how to deal with bigger quantities of unusual substances. Okay. This is my last slide. You know, you can educate yourself, uh, you know, uh, as you're doing today. If you're a landowner or if you have a lease, um, you can do whatever you can to work towards making an environmentally uh, friendly drilling if there is such a thing. Um, you know, address your concerns to your DEP or the DEC in New York State. Uh, visit and write your local officials. Tell them of your concern. Write letters to people, etc. cetera. Uh, and reduce your energy consumption. This is a big deal. Um, the, you know, the alleged purpose of doing this is to provide energy to the Northeast, even though we know that's probably not really true. They have other motivations for doing all this drilling right now. Most of it's going to foreign countries, of course. Um, but... Um, if you reduce your energy production in a graphic way, you can show people in the energy industry that we really want conservation. We want to reduce our energy consumption. We don't want more energy. <laughs> That's the message that we have to get across to some of these industry people. Um, at that point, I'm finished, and thank you very much. Appreciate the time. <laughs> one, more, one more quick one. All of the references, if you're a student and you're looking for research papers, all of my references are on the Cooperative Extension of Tompkins County website. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Shelley. This was a great presentation as well. Uh, as you notice, one of the chemicals he mentioned uh, was named OptiClean. I thought this is a mouthwash. <laughs> I mean, you could use it. But uh, this is how sometimes these things are so misleading. Uh, I would like to impose on our next two speakers if they make the presentation slightly shorter than 20 minutes you are supposed to, uh, we, so we can open the.